I can't believe Dragon's Dogma is nearly 9 years old. I can't believe I never knew about it until one of my subscribers asked me to give it a look. I can't believe the official sales records only show 1 million copies sold worldwide. It's got to be more than that. Dragon's Dogma is a flawed but immensely good action RPG. It reminds me of a proper old school high fantasy Dungeons and Dragons game. It also weirdly reminded me of Monster Hunter in some ways. It has an incredible amount of customization for your character, an innovative pawn system which is a companion based system, massive monsters and bosses to fight, very good day and night cycle and it's open world so you can wander wherever you like. The cities and dungeons are instant but the load times are pretty damn short. The original game was released back in 2012 for Xbox 360 and for PS3. Since then, the Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen DLC was released in 2013, it was ported to Windows in 2016, released on PS4 and Xbox One in 2017 and finally released on Nintendo Switch in 2019. Long story short, you can pretty much play this anywhere now. The original Dragon's Dogma was praised for its innovative pawn system but criticised for a somewhat lacking narrative. I don't entirely agree on that point but we'll get to that. First let me tell you a little bit about my experience with the game. I'll tell you some of the design history for the game, I'll talk about the story setting, the character creation and customization, the combat, the sorts of enemies you'll encounter, the companion system, the classes you can play and some of the highlights of my gameplay along with some frustrations I found with the game. Let me start by saying yes the game is a bit janky, there are bugs and imperfections, there are some issues which I'll talk about when we get into the details, but despite all of that, despite the flaws and a few annoying issues, I found the game to be immensely fun and pretty damn addictive. If you enjoy RPGs, character customization and development, monster hunting, tactical combat, high fantasy or anything from the Dungeons and Dragons era with hundreds of weapons and armor options to choose from and upgrade, then I suspect you'll find a lot to love in this game. Quickly before we start, this video was made possible by Games Planet, who kindly gifted a copy of Dragon's Dogma to me. The good thing for those of you with a PC is that Games Planet sell discounted Steam keys, and you will often find you'll be able to get the game you want at a slightly cheaper price than the base price on Steam. They also do some free giveaways at times too. If you like the look of Dragon's Dogma and you would like to support the channel, and also save yourself a couple of bucks in the process, then there is a link in the description you can use to go check it out. To reassure you, I will never recommend or make a favourable review for a game that I don't believe is good. Game Planet did not approach me to push this game, I'm reviewing it based on a recommendation from one of my subs. Ok, let's get into it. So the story setting for Dragon's Dogma opens with an unexpected attack on your village by a dragon. A fairly basic beginning to be honest. But one thing I loved here is that Dragon's Dogma doesn't have the stupid mindless beast sort of dragons you might find in some other story settings. The dragon here is smarter than you are, ancient, the sort of dragon a hobbit might need to outwit in a riddling game sort of dragon. I love that. Anyway, the protagonist subsequently gets an embarrassing spanking from the dragon which sets a series of events in motion and thus begins your quest. I won't ruin the story for those of you that haven't played this game. The story has got some definite plot holes and isn't perfect by any means but I will say there are surprising twists along the way, especially when you're getting to the end of your journey. It takes some time for the real story behind the game to become apparent. The story setting, combat and world design had some pretty impressive designers working on it. People like Haruo Murata who is known for his work on Resident Evil and Street Fighter Alpha. Makoto Ikehara who was involved with Breath of Fire and Dead Rising. Bingo Morihashi who was the writer for Bayonetta 2 and many of the Devil May Cry games. The original concept for the game comes from Hideaki Itsuno and the game takes inspiration from Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings and even an old film, The Neverending Story. The aim for the developers was, rather than using Japanese role playing traditions, to emulate western RPGs and as a result the team made several trips to Europe to research its scenery and architecture. When creating the dialogue for the game the team wanted to create a similar feeling to the writing of George R. R. Martin or Tolkien due to the dramatic style depicted in the game. You will notice as you play that semi archaic English words in the dialogue are often used which gives the game an old world fantasy feel about it outside of the graphical style or even the story itself. The entire story is voice acted in English or in Japanese if you buy that version and it has text translations for Japanese, English, Spanish, French, German, Italian and Chinese. All of this combined makes a world which to me feels like a fleshed out story from a full on fantasy book series. Ultimately Capcom's target was to apparently sell a million copies so by that measure it seemed like the game has been a success but honestly I still feel like it should have done better. It still feels underrated to me despite the flaws which we'll get into later on. In terms of the gameplay it actually impressed me right from the beginning. 
You start out in the game with a set character who has a sword and shield, but that only lasts for a few minutes of the game and is used as a basic tutorial of sorts. The initial combat feels weighty, when you hit your enemies every hit feels fluid and like it's making an impact. There are moments when the gameplay goes into slow motion, when one of your companions does something worth noting or that you can capitalise on. It makes for a dramatic introduction. Then you have the option to create your own character. Not only that, you also get to create your first pawn, who will be your constant companion through the game. The character customization is impressive in its depth, but obviously with the game being nearly 9 years old now, it does look a bit dated by today's standards. That aside though, I love the ability to not only create my own character, but also create my main companion in such detail. You can pick both your own vocation, which is in essence your character's class, and the vocation for your pawn. So this means you can, like I did initially, create your own tank and healer setup for example. Your companion will then level up with you. The good thing is that you can change your character's vocation at any point if you wish to, which is also what I did as I made further progress into the game. Initially you'll get the choice of three vocations, Fighter, Strider, which is your Ranger or Assassin type of class, and a Mage, which can be anything from a Necromancer type class to a Healer. Now the beauty of this system is that you can evolve these into almost anything you like. As you make progress through the game, advanced vocations will become available to you, along with additional skills and passive abilities. So for example, you can evolve your fighter into a warrior, and switch from using a sword and shield to a two-handed sword or mace. The downside is that you will need to level up your new vocation, so you will only begin with some basic skills, but honestly, it doesn't take too long to start unlocking the good stuff. There are quite a lot of options to choose from as you progress, including a magic archer, assassin, or even a mystic knight. Going back to the combat, this game has some of the best monster and boss mechanics I can think of at a base level. Smaller, more nimble characters can climb up onto larger monsters and target weak spots if you can hang on long enough. Your mage can stay at the back, blasting different areas of the beast with elements it's weak to, or setting down AoE effects, or spending time buffing other members of your party with fire or ice weapons for example. Archers can target weak spots, and fighters or warriors can jump into the fray, baiting the enemy, soaking up the damage, weaving out of the way of more dangerous attacks. This brings a more tactical gameplay to the fore, and the makeup of your party will help you dictate your approach to different fights. Your party will consist of yourself, your pawn companion, and two additional pawns you can pick up. The game is single player in essence, but the pawn system allows you to create a party of your choosing to complement your own character. Pawns are sometimes generated in the game, but often you'll find that pawns have been created and made available by other players. When you pick up a new pawn, they will be the same level as you, so it makes sense to constantly switch out your two recruited pawns to make sure they match your current level. You should also think about what your party is lacking, and check out a pawn's abilities before you recruit them. When you release a pawn, if it's player created, then you have the option to send them back with a gift to show your gratitude. You can also leave a rating and a message for the creator. It's a nice touch. The day and night cycle in the game also deserves a mention. This game has one of the most frightening night cycles I've ever experienced. If your lantern runs out of oil, and you're left in the dark, it's genuinely hard to see. This goes for some of the dungeons you'll find yourself in too. The lantern has been really well created so that it gives you enough light to see by, but only what's in front of you. Further back, you'll still be unaware of anything lurking in the darkness. You'll also find that out in the open world, enemies that attack might be different at night. Undead or covens of sorcerers will be hiding in the dark waiting to jump on you. Quests you will undertake involve anything from escort quests through to full-on dungeon exploration. There is also an affinity system baked in, which means that as you perform tasks or actions, different NPCs' affinity for you will increase or decrease. High affinity may open up new escort quests for minor characters, and can unlock high quality merchandise available from merchants. In terms of the difficulty, this game is actually no joke. There is very limited hand holding in the game. This is where you might find some initial frustrations. Some things in the game aren't explained all that well, so you really do need to stick with it in order to make progress. During my first few hours, I felt seriously underpowered. Myself or my party members getting destroyed by enemies unexpectedly, getting lost as hell because the map system is a little ropey and you actually have to find things for yourself. I admit though that's more my own fault than the games. My sense of direction both in games and in life is touch and go at the best of times. Occasionally I'd stumble into a dungeon, beating everything it has to offer, only to find there is a quest there later on, and I've already opened a chest which was supposed to have contained the quest item I needed, but didn't spawn because I hadn't taken the quest before I went in, and now I can't seem to loot it. These moments can be confusing and frustrating sometimes, especially if you have an innate and shameful lack of patience like I do. There are systems in place to help mitigate these moments, but they aren't always spelled out to you, so you may feel lost at times. You will need to spend some time figuring things out. Thankfully, there are around 15 billion guides available, so if you find yourself stuck, there is likely to be a solution for you if you simply take a moment to look it up. The AI of the pawns can be a bit ropey, it's definitely not a perfect system, 
but it does create a number of tactical options you can play out when it comes to the combat if you give enough thought to your team composition. You may find at times that walking a certain road is a bad idea. I found that slightly frustrating at times. The quest itself wasn't a problem, but the enemies along the way to the quest would give me issues, or be a lot tougher than I expected. Again though, as I put more time into the game, this became less of a problem for me. Fast travel in this game is an option, but again, this isn't spelled out to you in a tutorial. Once you get it though, it does make a huge difference to your gameplay. The game does take patience, it's strange, it made a great first impression on me, then 5 hours into the game I felt lost and annoyed. But after I got over some of the initial frustrations and the learning curve, I found myself unable to put it down. You're looking at around 40-50 to 50 hours gameplay at least with this game, most likely more if you really get into it and you want to start delving into the labyrinth in Bitter Black Isle in the Dark Arisen DLC. I love my time with Dragon's Dogma, it's like picking up a favourite book. The pages are a little crumpled and the ink may be smudged here and there, but it's still got so much in there both familiar and new and strange that I just had to pick it up. Quick reminder to those of you interested in playing this, if you want a digital copy on PC and you want to support the channel, you can pick up a discounted Steam key from the link in the description. Before you go, please leave me a like and comment if you don't mind, sub if you're new, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you for watching, take care, stay safe, bye bye now.